Open up again to the book of Hebrews in chapter 4. Uh, we're going to pick it up at verse 14. Just a few verses to cover, but, but just like last week, they have so much to say as the author takes his audience into what really might be the largest theme of the book of Hebrews, this, this idea of Jesus as the high priest of God's people. Uh, so we're, we're just going to begin to explore what that means uh, for, for us, the people of God, and, and what it meant when this letter was written as we pick it up in Hebrews chapter 4 at verse 14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. As we seek to understand everything that that might mean for us, let's pray together. Lord, we come to you this morning hungry for wisdom. God, give us wisdom and knowledge and understanding about what it means to talk about you as our Lord, our Savior, our King, and now as our High Priest. What does it mean, Lord, for us to open our Bibles and see that, that you are exalted as the High Priest of your people? Help us to understand that today, Lord, to see how it is revealed in your gospel, to see what it means for us as stones, living stones in your temple, as branches on the true vine, meant to bear good fruit, meant to show the world your glory, your power, your salvation. Lord, give us wisdom, reform our hearts, renew our minds. We pray and seek your help this morning, dear God. Amen. I think for us to really understand what verse 14 and 15 and 16 have to say, we actually have to dial it back one verse and, and remember what was the last thing that the author had to tell his readers back in verse 13 here in chapter 4, which was the last verse that we studied last Sunday. So for a group of Christians who are, at the time that they received this letter, in the middle of what the author calls the time of their temptation, right? That's the trial that they're fighting through because they're seemingly being persecuted on all sides, and while well, all signs point to the idea that it's going to get even worse, the author gives them these words from verse 13, and I don't really see any other way to read them other than like a stern warning to a people who are vulnerable to temptation, that he tells them, no creature is hidden from God's sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Essentially, what he's telling them is that they're there is none of us who are so small or insignificant that we can escape God's attention. We can have no confidence in the idea that, well, I'm just little old me. What does God care what I'm up to? Why would he pay attention to what I'm doing, both in public and behind closed doors? The inverse of that is also true, that there's no one who is so great or important or necessary that God would overlook what they do and what they say. There's no one who gets a free pass from the judgment of God because they're just a person of such high status or great importance or vast wealth or anything like that. These words are a warning that when we stand before the throne of God for judgment, and all of us will, on that day, all of us are equal. All of us stand naked and exposed before his eyes.
from the greatest of us to the least of us, God will look at us from his throne and he will see everything that is in us. Everything that we are and everything that we've done. All the stuff that's in our mind, all the stuff that's in our heart. Stuff that we might have been able to hide from everyone else for our whole lives. He'll see it on that day. And he'll have known about it all along. It's a warning that we really are powerless to cover up anything from God. That there's no amount of religious showmanship, (laughs) which the Bible would call hypocrisy, that will cover up who we really are, how we really think and what we really believe. And on that day, when it's time for us to go before the throne, we will have to answer to him for all of it. Now, having come out of Judaism, as the readers, the original audience of this letter has, most of them were former Jews who are now following Jesus. This is something that the readers of Hebrews would have heard and and already known. This isn't new news to them. This isn't a new revelation. They've live their entire lives, uh, you know, if they understand anything about the Torah, fully expecting that out of every being in creation, God alone knows their hearts. God alone knows what's in their minds. He sees everything, he knows everything, and perhaps most of all, he sees through everything. That he's got your name somewhere in his book, and it's either going to be the book of life or it's going to be the book of death. And on that great and terrible day of the Lord, ultimate justice is going to be handed down one way or the other. And people from all nations, beginning with Israel, are going to have to stand before God and answer for their sins. They've known that all their lives. But they have also known that because they were God's people, there was hope for them. That the the day of the Lord was not nearly as, as bleak as it as it might sound, certainly as as we've made it sound so far this morning. There was hope for them because there was help for them as the people of God. The laws of Moses had given Israel one special guy who could be their helper. The high priest of the temple. The guy at the top of the priesthood. He was assigned to be the mediator of the covenant relationship between God and his people. One guy who was privileged to wear the holy vestments with the beautiful jewels and the gold, the gold plate on his turban that said, Holy to Yahweh, the chest plate that had the the names of all the 12 tribes of Israel engraved into it, because when he put that on, he assumed responsibility for all 12 tribes. He carried them carried the weight of them on his shoulders, and he carried them in his heart as he worked in the temple. He alone had the, I mean, you almost want to call it a privilege, but it's like a great and terrible privilege. It was to be, to be done with reverence and fear. But he had the assignment. He alone could go behind the veil of the temple on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, and stand in that most holy place, the Holy of Holies, the place where God made his presence. He could stand in the presence of the holy, holy, holy God on that day with the special task that on behalf of the whole nation of his people, the high priest would sprinkle blood of an offering on God's mercy seat. And as he did that, he would seek mercy for all of Israel's sins and the sacrifice would atone for them his work would atone for the sins of the entire nation, wipe the slate clean. So Israel could, could depend on him. They could depend on the faithful ministry of this high priest to make atonement for their sins, to grant them a pardon from God's wrath. So when they thought about having to answer for their sins, They didn't have to to shake with fear. 
They could turn to the high priest and say, yeah, but God gave us that guy. And God gave us this day of atonement. God gave us a way to have our sins blotted out. And it's through his ministry. But these readers, the people who originally got this letter, you know, they've walked away from all that. What does the high priest's ministry mean to them now? That they've left Judaism, left the temple and the law and all the ritual that comes with it to go follow Jesus. Well, they can't run to the high priest now and say, go and make an offering for me because, because I, I've sinned and I need my sins to be wiped away. They can't depend on the ministry of the high priest now. In fact, what would they even think of the high priest now that they've been shown the gospel? So, now they're going through life knowing that they, they still someday will have to give an answer to God. They'll still have to go before his throne naked and exposed. And who's there to help them? Who's there to help them now? Who can they turn to? Whose ministry can they depend on to be their help on the day of the Lord? Who will make atonement for their guilt? And who will minister, their, minister to them in their time of weakness? There are people who still need a helper. They're a nation still in need of an advocate. So what the author is telling them in this section, when he starts to talk about Jesus as the great high priest, is that they still have a helper. That God has not left them in need. God has not left them wanting. He's provided for them everything. In fact, what the author is intent on showing them is not just that they still have a high priest, but that they actually have a much better high priest than they've ever had before. That what belongs to the church is a better high priest than there has ever been in the whole history of Israel. Even better than Aaron, who was the first one. That they have a high priest who comes from an entirely different priesthood, a much better one than the one that was given to them in the law. They have the best possible high priest, the maximally ideal one, one who is more capable and far more qualified than anyone who has ever stepped through that veil, anyone who has ever worked in the temple. And they can turn to him. They have a high priest who they can turn to. They have a high priest whose ministry they can still depend on. And the author starts to tell them that when he writes to them that they don't just have a high priest, they have a great high priest. What we translate as great in our modern English Bibles is this Greek word, megon, where we get like mega, meaning that he is, he's not just great, he's the most great. He's the greatest. He stands alone. He is far, far, far superior to all other high priests that have ever been or ever will be. Our high priest is the only high priest in all creation, in all history, who could be called the great one. He is one of one. So his readers don't have to have any fear or any anxiety that, well, now I can't go to my high priest in the temple because God has given them a high priest who's infinitely greater. He's greater because of what he does, what he has done, and who he is. The author tells them next that, well, our high priest is great because he he has done things that no, no one else ever has or ever could. That this great high priest, he alone has passed through the heavens. Now the readers of this letter are supposed to hear that and immediately hear the comparison with, with the work of the high priest back in the temple. They're supposed to hear that and remember that all the other high priests in Israel's history you know, their, their most important, most sacred job was to go and stand in God's presence on Yom Kippur, was to go and pass through that veil 
into the Holy of Holies in the earthly temple and make the blood offering for Israel's sins. And of course, when his work was finished, you don't just get to hang out in the Holy of Holies, you have to go. But this great high priest, the one that belongs to the church, the one who we have, he hasn't just passed through the veil of a temple here on earth. He has passed through the heavens. He's passed through the heavenly veil. He has entered he has entered the heavenly temple, which itself is the glorious blueprint for the temple that was built on earth. You know, when God handed down the instructions of the law to Moses for the tabernacle and the temple, he told him, like, this, this is supposed to be eh, sort of a reflection of this holy temple that exists in the heavens. Well, that's the temple that our high priest has stepped into, which is far greater, infinitely greater, so far beyond the glory of the temple here on earth. Our high priest hasn't just stepped into the holiest place on earth. He has entered the holiest place in the entire universe, in all of creation. He stands in the Father's presence, in the Father's own heavenly throne room. And in fact, when our high priest enters that throne room, it's not, it's not just the Father's throne room, it's, it's His too, because He sits down at the right hand of the Father. So our high priest is great because He goes where the, the, all the priests who belong to the line of Aaron, the, the line of priests that was given through the law, our high priest goes where they could only dream of going. And He doesn't have to leave. He gets to stay there because He belongs there because he has the right to be there. Our high priest has access to the Father in ways that no other priest that has ever been or ever would be could possibly have. And because of that, he makes intercession for his people in a way that no other priest ever could. And that's one of the reasons why he stands alone. That's why he is not just great, he is the maximally great. The author tells his readers that our great high priest is no one else but Jesus, the Son of God. So he's great because of what he does and because of who he is. I think the author is very intentional in how he writes that. Because... In those few words, in that brief title, Jesus, the Son of God, he brings together this reminder of Jesus' humanity, but also Jesus' divinity. They coexist there, just in, in the simple way that he wrote that. Right? So the high priest is Jesus, Yeshua. That's the name given to God the Son when he took on flesh, when the Word became flesh and pitched his tent and dwelt among us. That's the name Joseph gave him. The name itself, Yeshua, places this emphatic reminder upon the fact that, that Jesus really was fully human. That for a time, he shared our nature, became like us. He experienced our struggle because he took on flesh he experienced what it is like to wrestle against sin as one who has the flesh in the same way that we do. So there's that reminder of his humanity, but then the author says he's Jesus, the Son of God. So he immediately meets that with this reminder of his divinity as well. That he really is the one who who has been God's Son since from before the beginning that he really is eternal. The author wants his readers to remember that, that yes, this fully human Jesus has always also been fully divine. That even when he took on flesh, he never stopped being fully God. And that is what makes our high priest so uniquely great. That's what puts him so far above all the others. 
That's what makes him such a powerful help to his people. Only Jesus can come to us as both fully man and fully God. Only Jesus is is perfectly set apart from human weakness because he's divine, but also perfectly understands human weakness because for a moment he participated in it. He volunteered to experience it. He wrestled against it in the same way that we do. What makes our high priest so great is what the author alluded to back in chapter 2 at verse 18, that because he himself suffered when tempted, he can help us who are being tempted. And it's a really, it's a really good time to, to give his readers this important reminder because what have we been doing all throughout the letter of Hebrews so far? Well, the author's just been exalting Jesus heaping greatness upon greatness upon greatness, telling his readers how how powerful and awesome and amazing Jesus is. He's greater than the prophets. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than Joshua. He's even greater than the angels. And that might leave his readers feeling a little bit like, gosh, if Jesus is so much greater than well, then all of them, all these guys who we look up to, who are so much greater than us, well, if Jesus is so much greater than them, well, then he must be so high above us, lowly little creatures, that how can someone so holy, so great, so powerful, so majestic, how could someone like that understand what it's like for us? How can someone who's so high up possibly relate to the experience of us who are down here? At the bottom of the ladder. How can, how can perfection relate to imperfection? How can strength relate to weakness? It's possible that they had it in their minds that Jesus was so far above them, he just can't possibly understand how they think or how they feel, especially when they're going through trials. So the author, I think, puts that right there to tell them, no, that's not the way it is at all. Our high priest is great. Don't misunderstand that. Everything we've said about him so far is true. He is maximally great. He's perfect. He's holy. However, that doesn't mean he can't understand us. Because our high priest, gosh, he doesn't just understand us. He suffers with us. That's what the author tells them in verse 15. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us. Sympathize in Greek, sympateo. Literally meaning to suffer with. Sympathy. To sympathize. Might be a word that we have developed a bad definition of. Maybe we don't fully understand it. Because I think, commonly, we believe sympathy is something that can be kind of summarized in a greeting card. Something you can show through the words of Hallmark or shoebox greetings. Something that can be adequately summed up by something you would find at a CVS. Yellow flowers in a pink envelope. Sympathy is so much more than just hey, I feel bad that you're having a bad time. Sympathy is so much more than just, hey man, I feel for you. I hate it for you. Sympathy is, I am bearing this burden with you. I know what you're going through, and I know how much it hurts, so I'm going to suffer with you so that you don't have to do this alone. I'm going to mourn with you for that, that loved one who you've lost. I'm going to grieve with you that they took your house or that you lost your job. I'm going to rage with you. I'm going to be frustrated with you because I know what it's like to be treated unfairly or unjustly. 
that sympathy. It's not to suffer sort of at an arm's distance from someone and try to bridge that gap with a little gift. It's to be arm in arm with them and to say, I'm here suffering too. What's the object of Jesus' sympathy? Well, the author makes it pretty clear. He says he sympathizes with us in our weakness. So as we suffer because of weakness, Jesus suffers with us because he knows what human weakness is like. Jesus knows what our suffering is like. And he doesn't just know it as like a concept that you would read about in a book. He knows it fully. He knows it completely. He knows it intimately because he's experienced it too. And that's why he's able to suffer with us. He's able to be our great high priest, be our help when we're tempted because Jesus has been in every respect tempted as we are. That's how the author puts it. Now what does that mean? To say that Jesus has been in every way like to every extreme, tempted as we are. Well, because what tempts us while our various trials and challenges? So has Jesus experienced all of the trials and challenges that we experience? That's not what that means. Right? There are certain challenges and trials that Jesus, by definition, uh, never had to experience. Right? He was never married, so Jesus never had to experience a divorce. Uh, Jesus didn't work for a corporation, so Jesus never got fired from his job. Jesus didn't own a house, so Jesus never had a house foreclosed on. You know, there are, we, we could get lost saying, well, did Jesus experience all the specific tests that I've experienced? No, but here's what it does mean. That what underlies all the different trials and challenges that we go through that, that manifest themselves in our lives what underlies them is really like a basic set of temptations, of challenges that we have to wrestle with. Bigger things like heartbreak, anger, frustration, loneliness, sadness. So when it says that Jesus has been tempted in every respect like us, it's like, He's wrestled with all of the same basic trials and challenges that we have to wrestle with. Right? If, you get, if you do get booted from a job, what do you go home wrestling with? Fear? Bitterness? How could they do that to me? Anger? What this means is that Jesus wrestled with things like that. When we go through heartbreak, when we lose someone who we loved, what do we experience? Well, probably again, some fear. Probably, again, some frustration. But man, sadness, loneliness, isolation. Jesus wrestled with all that stuff. His temptations are of the same nature as the temptations that we experience. What this verse means is that Jesus went and did battle with all the same kinds of trials and challenges that we do. And that he had to wrestle, them, wrestle with them in the same nature that we have. All right? Because remember, that's, that's his full humanity and his full divinity. So it's not like Jesus was tempted, but, well, but well he's God. So he, he was never really tempted. It's like, no, in his full humanity, he experienced having to resist anger and having to resist sadness and having to resist bitterness in all the same ways that we would. That's why he can understand what it's like for us, because he had to fight that battle the same way that we do. When we think of Jesus being tempted, you know, where do our minds immediately go? Well, probably to that experience that he has with Satan in the wilderness, right? Oh, you're so hungry, turn the stones into bread. Oh, you know, you're so great, why don't you call down angels? They'll come and catch you if you jump off the temple. Hey, why don't you bow down to me? I'll give you control of all the kingdoms of the world, right? but the temptations that Jesus experienced, the moments where he was tested or tried by something, go so far beyond just that little entry in the Gospels where he's going one-on-one with the devil, and of course he wins. 
It's not the only day of his life that Jesus had to endure temptation. Just like our lives are filled with various trials, as James says, well, Jesus' life was the same way because it was a life lived here in the place where there are constantly trials of various kinds all around us. When the crowds came to Jesus, for instance, in John chapter 6, at verse 15, and they were so on fire for what Jesus was saying that they wanted by force to take him and install him as the king of Israel to essentially lead an insurrection against the king and, and put Jesus on the throne. That's an example of what I'm talking about. That's like one of these moments where Jesus was probably tempted to go one way or the other, right? Because the crowds came to him and, and, and man, they're loud and, and they're ready to go to war for him. And it's, he could have just said like, okay, <laughs> like, let's do it. I'm supposed to be the king anyway. Yeah, let's go fight that guy. Let's go get rid of Herod. You guys deserve a better king, right? He could have gone that way. I mean, he couldn't have. He's Jesus. But, you know, the temptation was there. The trial was there. That's what I'm getting at. When the rich young man, for instance, came to Jesus and, and he says, hey, I've been following the law my whole life. What do I have to do to receive eternal life? And Jesus tells him, well, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Right? He could have said, well, sell everything you have and come and give it to me. He could have exploited that young man's curiosity to get at some of his wealth. There are religious leaders who do stuff like that all the time. There were times where Jesus was, you know, we, we always think of his suffering, but man, there were times in his ministry when he was, when he was up instead of down. There's a time in, in the Gospels where Jesus has this massive following where, where he's... He's got thousands of people who are coming to hear him teach. And at any moment, he could have exploited them and used them for his own gain. He could have exploited them and used them to make him rich, to make him famous, to give him power and prestige and privilege. But he never did. There were times where Jesus was up, and of course we know there were times where Jesus was down, where Jesus has to endure heartbreak. I mean, my gosh, this is a guy who, who went to the cross after being rejected by his own people, betrayed by his own friends, who was denied three times by the very best of his friends. You don't think Jesus in all those days had to resist some anger and some frustration? I mean, this is a guy who every time he tried to teach in public, somebody was there to, to pick a fight with him. Some group of those Pharisees would come find him and try to lay these little traps for him. And, and you know, what they thought they were going to do was to reveal him as someone who actually didn't know the law or didn't love the law, like he said. Someone who should be hated instead of followed. Those guys popped up throughout his ministry all the time. Even among his own disciples. The guys who he kept with him, who he was teaching all the time, telling them things and showing them things and revealing things to them. He had to deal with disciples who, gosh, didn't understand him. Didn't understand even at the most basic level, some of the stuff he was teaching them. Right? When he tells them, hey, when we get to Jerusalem, I'm going to be handed over to the Gentiles. I'm going to be crucified and killed, but don't worry, because I'm going to rise again. The Bible tells us that the disciples didn't even understand that. That they started going, man, what could he possibly be talking about? Gosh, or when he tells Peter, when Peter says, hey, some people say you're a prophet, some people say you're Elijah. I say you're the Son of God and you're the Messiah. And Jesus says, yeah, Peter, you're right. And I'm going to go to Jerusalem and die. What does Peter do? Even Peter argues with him. He says, no, Jesus, that could never happen to you. So even the disciples who were supposed to be able to teach the world about him for a time had trouble understanding him. Tell me that's not frustrating. 
Jesus had to stand before crowds. The very people he was sent to bring salvation to, he had to stand before crowds in Jerusalem who were chanting for his death. They were saying, yeah, crucify that man. How would that make you feel? I can't even handle it when someone comes up and tells me they didn't like the message. What do you think it would do to me if I had to stand before, you know, 200 people who are going like, kill that guy. Jesus had to suffer the injustice and the unfairness of watching a criminal, Barabbas, go free instead of him, even though he was perfectly innocent. What would that do to you? What would you be wrestling with in a moment like that? Chances are, whatever you come up with, Jesus wrestled with the same things in that moment. We can easily say that throughout his life here, in moments like all the ones we just visited, Jesus' temptations, gosh, I mean, they're like ours, but they're not just like ours. They're so much more intense than ours. Here's why. Because he never stopped being like all-powerful God. So when Jesus suffers, he suffers, and the whole time he suffers knowing that it is perfectly within his power to just change everything, (laughs) to refuse to let this happen, right? Sometimes we suffer and it's like, well, there's nothing I can do about this. So you kind of have to resign to what's going to happen to you. Jesus never has to do that, right? He endures all of his suffering with the, with the temptation that's constantly there that like, man, I could, I could just call down fire on all my enemies and shut them up. I could just change everyone's minds, right? Jesus could have at any moment wiped out his enemies with a thought. He could have at any moment just made himself rich and powerful. I mean, gosh, he pulls a coin out of a fish's mouth. How many times could he have done that? Jesus, at any moment, could have avenged himself when injustice was done to him. Could have gotten even when someone broke his heart. Jesus, at any moment, could have escaped his fate. When he's being arrested in the garden, you know, and Peter takes up that sword and he strikes Malthus on the ear, Jesus could have just let Peter keep fighting for him. Heck, he could have summoned all the other disciples to go and fight for him too. More than that, he he actually tells Peter uh, in Matthew 26, 53, I could appeal to my father and he would send down two legions of angels to come and fight for me, to come and free me from, from the Romans who are arresting me. But he never does that. He never does anything like that. He always manages to resist the temptation that's there to use his godly power to free him from these human circumstances. Because the scripture has to be fulfilled. Because he has to drink the cup. It can't be passed from him. Because the Father's will has to be done. So in every moment Jesus suffers, he has infinite capacity and infinite potential to get out of it, but he never does because he never seeks his own will. He endures temptation. He suffers through trials. He comes up against challenges and he always emerges victorious. He always comes through without sin because he always perfectly bows to the Father's will. It's not even enough to say that Jesus endures trials. He endures fiery trials. He endures the most fiery trials, and he passes them all. Resists all temptation. And always manages to perfectly obey his Father. He is truly, as Paul said about him in 2 Corinthians 5.21, him who is without sin. So what a comfort it ought to be for us, for God's people, to know 
that the one who sits at the Father's right hand, the one who we can turn to and say, that is my high priest. That is the one whose work I can depend on. Perfectly understands what we go through when we endure trial and when we endure temptation. Because He has walked that path before us in the same way that we have to. The one who sits at the Father's right hand knows truly and fully what we need when we're being tempted. He knows how to minister to us because He's been tempted by all the same stuff that we've been tempted by, that we are being tempted by. And that means... That when we suffer, we never suffer alone. We talked last week about the, the ministry of encouragement and exhortation that we owe to each other as brothers and sisters. But we're also exhorted and encouraged and ministered, by, ministered to, not just horizontally by the people on our left and right, but from above, by our great high priest who sits in the very presence of the Father. So we never suffer alone. When we struggle against our weakness, we don't struggle by ourselves. I, I tell you, man, it can be a very, um, very damaging and dangerous thought that when we, when we know we're being tempted by something, when we know we're being tested by something, uh, to feel like, Oh my gosh, like, no one else probably wrestles with this kind of temptation. How weak must I be? How foolish must I be? Nobody else can be as weak or as dumb as I am to have to wrestle with stuff like I do. It's very easy to convince ourselves that, like, we are uniquely weak out of all God's people, that we must suffer alone because nobody could be as bad as we are. Well, the Word would encourage us to remember, you do not suffer by yourself. You're not the only one who struggles against weakness. Your high priest struggled against it too. So if nobody else can relate to you, if you somehow get it in your head that nobody else can relate to what you're being tempted by, he can. He can relate to that. And he can minister to you in the middle of that because he knows what you need. And man, I mean, remember that because that alone can be such a, such a powerful thing to know <laughs> that when you're in the middle of your struggle, it's just someone somewhere is struggling along with you. Someone else somewhere knows what it's like in your heart and in your mind, knows what it's like to feel the pain and to feel the temptation that you feel. That alone is a powerful thing. I know that because I, I have been ministered to by that uh, in a very real way. Actually, not, not even by just a person, but, but by a book, weirdly enough. It's one of my all-time favorite books. It's called All Quiet on the Western Front. Did you have to read that in school, by chance? That's the first time I read it. Uh, actually, when I was in high school, and it didn't mean much to me then, but gosh, it came to mean a lot to me over the years. Because I read it then, and then I never thought about it, and then someone actually mailed me a copy of it while I was deployed to Afghanistan, and over the roughly year and a half that I was there, I managed to read it a second time. And then when I came home from the army, I reread it a third time. Because when I came back to civilian life, I came back at a time that I was struggling with some pretty serious, you know, PTSD symptoms. Couldn't sleep, didn't really want to make any friends, didn't really want to participate in society. Terrible dreams, terrible thoughts, just terrible feelings all the time. And on the rare occasions that you could actually get me to talk about it, I always felt like I was being reminded that no one else around me had to suffer the way I was. That no one around me could relate to it, not even other veterans. Because some of the older guys who had gone to Nam before me thought they knew 
you know, what the war was like, and they'd tell me, oh, it can't be that bad for you. It can't be as bad as it was for me. Ha, ha, ha. Okay. I didn't have any family who served. I didn't really have very many friends who had served, so no one around me was going through the same stuff that I was. Nobody could talk to me about it in a way that showed me they understood. So when I read that book again, I got to this part, there's this part in that story, All Quiet on the Western Front, where the main character, his name's Paul. He's a young German man who fights in World War I, and he comes back home to his German hometown. Remember, World War I is the one where the Germans weren't Nazis, okay? So it's not a Nazi book. <laughs> but he comes back home to his German hometown from the trenches of World War I, and at first when he gets home, he's happy to be there because he's away from the war. But pretty quickly he realizes he can't relate to anyone back home anymore. His mind has been changed by the stuff that he's had to do and the stuff he's had to experience. So when people ask him questions about how the war is going, he says they're just annoying and their questions are stupid. And when people make comments to him about the war, it's like he can't deal with it. They just bother him. And he's surrounded by people who are really enthusiastic about the war because, you know, they've never been to the front. And that drives him nuts because it's like, how can you be cheering this on? You don't know what it's like for us out there. And we're just a bunch of young guys who are having to go through this. So when he's back home, he spends all of his time feeling like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to just go back to the front lines. <laughs> I can't wait to go back to the trenches because at least there, people understand me. And at least there, people know what it's like. And they don't do this annoying stuff that people do back home. And gosh, when I read that, it was like, it hit me all at once. I spent all this time thinking I was suffering alone. I was never alone. That book was written by a German guy all the way back in 1929. And reading it again showed me like, Across that gap of time and culture and everything else, this guy understands what I'm going through as an American in 2010. And if that can be true, then, then maybe what I'm going through is more universal than I think. It's not that I'm too weak. It's not that I'm broken. It's not that, I mean, there's a lot wrong with me, but it's not that I'm suffering because there's something wrong with me. Maybe this is just something that war does to young men. And maybe there's a lot more people than I think who are going through the same stuff that I'm going through, who are in the middle of the same fight that I'm in the middle of. And I tell you, when I realized that for the first time, that finally gave me the courage to talk about it. Because I didn't feel like a freak. And I didn't feel, I didn't feel uniquely weak or uniquely broken. Because it's like, in any room of a hundred people, if there's at least two other veterans in there, one of them might know what I'm going through. One of them might be able to relate to what I'm going through. It meant, I tell you that whole story to get to this one point. It meant the world to me to know that I just wasn't alone. And that's part of the point that the author is making to his readers here. That because we, as the people of God, have Jesus as our high priest, We are not alone when we fight against the weakness of our flesh, when we wrestle with the temptations of the world. Jesus fights this fight with us, and he knows exactly what we need to endure it, because he's already fought it too. And we can look to him and depend on him and we can see from his example that no matter how challenging the trial is or how bleak our story becomes, our victory against temptation is always possible. Because Jesus suffered in ways that, that we can't even touch. And he always emerged victorious against temptation. The cross of our Lord is the ultimate demonstration of victory over temptation, endurance in the face of trials and challenges. 
endurance to remain faithful to the will of God, no matter what. Jesus' atoning death for our good, for our sins, is the perfect picture of faithfulness to the Father's will and is a constant reminder to us that it's possible against all trials and challenges. The cross is the ultimate piece of good fruit that comes to us from the true vine. So what should that mean to us who have heard this word? What should that mean to us who benefit from from the work of this great high priest who we have? Well, it means that we can always go forward standing fast in the gospel, completely unafraid and unanxious about what might happen. And that's really the author's message here. That because we have Jesus as this great high priest, because he ministers to us knowing perfectly what we need, let's hold fast to our confession. There's an exhortation in there. Hold fast to our confession. Let's cling to this gospel of Christ crucified. That's the author telling this church that he's writing to that no matter what persecution comes your way, no matter who stands against you, I don't care if it's Caesar himself, you can boldly live out your faith. You can boldly preach this gospel. Shout it from the rooftops and the street corners. Assemble for worship. Sing hymns. Preach the gospel. Teach the word. Love the brothers. Do it all without fear. Continue to do it no matter what happens. Have joy in doing it because you have placed all of your trust and all of your hope in the work of your great high priest who has done what is needed to make atonement for our sins, who now sits at the Father's right hand because as he said on the cross, it is finished. So no matter what comes our way, we have the encouragement of knowing that we have him as our helper. We have a high priest we can turn to. One who can give us everything that we need to stay strong when we have to battle against our weakness. Because he too has overcome weakness. Get right down to it. What the author is basically telling this church is like, don't let persecution, don't let your difficulties be an excuse to, to be unfaithful to the word, to be unfaithful to the gospel. It's kind of telling them that, hey, no matter what happens, we have no excuse. We must continue to preach Christ. We must continue to come together. We must continue to, to love each other and stir each other up to, to bear good fruit. We have no excuse because we know who it is that we can depend on. We know who it is who can help us. In the time of our temptation, He is our help. And He invites us to lean on Him for strength and for courage. The high priest, you know, in the the Old Testament Levitical law system, when he stepped into that Holy of Holies, he had to do it full of fear and trembling. Standing in God's presence was a fearful thing. But we get this invitation from Hebrews to draw near to Him with confidence. We are instructed by the author to approach His throne with boldness. That's what it means to draw near with confidence. It's really like boldness. Boldness that comes from a sincere faith in His gospel and a total trust in His Son. You know, we started, we started at the throne of God that, that that was the place of his authority. That's the place of his judgment. 
right? It, it's from his throne that he will see us and, and we stand fully exposed and totally naked before him. But the author reminds us that for the people of God, because of this gospel, because of our Messiah, our Savior, because of our high priest, that throne that looms so big and, and so, so scary and so terrible in our minds, that throne is actually also the throne of God's grace. It is the throne of grace, he calls it. And it's not just where we go to stand for judgment. It's where the letter of Hebrews tells us to go to find his unmerited favor. To go to find his mercy. To blot out our sins. Because of what Jesus has done, the throne of God for us doesn't just become a place of judgment. It becomes the place of grace and mercy. Which is our, our only hope. <laughs> But praise God, the only hope we need to be able to draw near to him with boldness. We wondered, you know, what, what all this stuff about Jesus as our high priest would mean for us as the church. Well, I think we found our answer. That we can turn to him in the same way the people of God has al have always turned to their high priest for help when we needed it. We can depend on him in the same way the people of God in centuries past depended on the high priest to go to work for them, we can depend on him and his work, his completed work. That's revealed to us in the gospel. That when we need help, when we need his grace and we need his mercy, we don't have to be so unafraid, or we can be unafraid and approach his throne. that we don't have to look anywhere else or to anyone else other than our great high priest to find help in the time of our temptation. So as the worship team rejoins us, let's pray together. Our Lord Jesus, our great high priest, Jesus, the Son of God, Lord, we thank you for the many ways, the many necessary ways that you minister to us in the middle of our weakness. Thank you, Lord, for emptying yourself out, taking on flesh and dwelling among us so that you, that you would know perfectly what it's like for us to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with our anger, for us to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against lust, for us to go toe-to-toe -to -toe against greed, and all of the other, all the other words we could plug in there as a temptation or a trial that we have to endure. Lord, thank you that your word tells us that you've endured those same trials. So you know what it's like for us, and that's why you can be such a perfect help when we need it most. Lord, we need you all the time. We lean on you. We depend on you. So Lord, let this be a, a time that reminds us to never fail to turn to you. When we need help, when we're being tempted, when we're about to, to click on something we shouldn't or entertain some idea that we shouldn't or when we have some, some thought, some notion that we know is, is unholy, unrighteous, something that comes to us from the flesh and not from your spirit. Lord, let us always remember to turn to you first, to come running to your throne, to find the grace to endure temptation and trials today, to find the mercy that covers our sins when weakness gets the best of us. In your glorious name, dear Jesus, we pray. Amen.
You'll have to forgive me. I can't recall right now exactly where it is in Paul's epistles. That he says, when we are tempted, God has given us a means of escape. That escape is Christ. He is where we find strength in the middle of our weakness. To resist temptation, to endure trials, to bear good fruit. Shall we say, to bear good fruit even in the middle of a drought. So let us never fail to turn to Him in our prayers, to turn to Him with our attention and our focus, to cling to Him with all effort in the time of our temptation. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May He make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May He lift His countenance on you and give you peace until we're together again.